Now, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your kind attention. Now, to continue with the demonstration, you must remember one thing. Pocket billiards, sometimes commonly referred to as pool, is a gentleman's game. Uh, it should uh, be a very good game for you, uh, <clears throat> gentlemen. <laughs> <clears throat> now, for my next shot, I would like to demonstrate one that requires all the science and skill of this wonderful game. It's called the bank shot. That fellow there sold me the table. He's going to be staying in town a couple of weeks to demonstrate and give some lessons. Hey, Hoss, why don't you give it a try? Oh, no, Sam, come on. It looks a little fancy for me. Oh, come on, Hoss, try it. You heard him, Sam. Besides, didn't you hear the man say it's a gentleman's game? Big game back east. That's where they invented it. Your pardon, sir. For your information, the game of pocket billiards is not a... Only a most honorable one, but a very ancient one to boot. Certainly, it was known in Shakespeare's day. Is that a fact? Oh, yeah. Wasn't it uh, Antony and Cleopatra, Act Two, now yeah, Scene Five, where Shakespeare has Cleopatra say, "Blood us to billiards, come, come in." Shakespeare, and you, sir. My name's Carteret, Hoss Carteret. I know. Mr. William Shakespeare and Mr. Hoss Carteret. My name is Parker, Whitney Parker. At times my friends call me Whit. And upon other occasions, my legal opponents call me <laughs> Half Whit. <laughs> you, uh... Your lawyer. Mm, that's what it says in my diploma. Yes. You uh, figure on hanging around Virginia City? Maybe. Maybe. I, I kind of like the looks of things around here. Now that gentleman is called the break shot. That starts off the game. <coughs> now, which one of you gentlemen would like to try to take this cue and put some of those balls in the pocket? Well, now, really, gentlemen. I'm offering you a great opportunity here to learn this game. It's an awful lot of fun. Won't cost you one cent. I'm sure, gentlemen, that you... What, don't I have any takers? <laughs> I'm giving two to one he doesn't even hit that little ball with a stick. How about it, Cartwright? You, uh... You got your big brother's permission to bet? Never mind, my brother. How much do you want to bet? Oh, make it make it 25 against your 50. You got to bet. <laughs> sure. I think I'd better show you how to hold the cue. Uh, <clears throat> this is the cue. Sir, are a magnificent instructor. You have my highest recommendation. Fifty dollars, Mr. Derby. You and this tin horn are in cahoots. You're nothing but a dirty swindler, Cartwright. The bet's off. My 
My compliments, sir. A beautiful break shot with nature's own cue stick. <laughs> if you should ever need any legal advice, Mr. Cartwright, feel free to call on me for you, my good man. I keep the change. Gentlemen, good day. Let's hope you never need a lawyer that bad, Hoss. couple weeks after ranch. Hey, uh, Benji, you wanna, you wanna do me a big favor? Take a, take a look at that right foreleg on that horse of mine. He's been limping something fierce. And you got such a good way with animals. Sure. Just as soon as I... Oh, here, here, here. Oh, ain't no use me fooling around something like this when there's something important to do like taking care of my horse. Son of a gun's kind of moody, Benji. I reckon he's just in a mood to limp. I'll walk it out of him. Look at him. What I tell you about it being moody, see, now, he, now he's in the mood to walk. Mr. Cartwright, you think I'll ever be big and strong like you? I don't know, Benji. That sort of depends on how big your folks was. Oh, my gosh, it ain't big. My grandpa, he was a real big and they say. Monstrous. <laughs> well, in that case, Benji, if you concentrate on it real hard, I'll bet you one of these days you'll make it. I'll sure try, Mr. Cartwright. I'll bust my britches trying. Well, I gotta go now. Bye-bye. So long, Benji. Watch this one, boys. Now I shall demonstrate a shot executed in the most difficult manner possible. Watch carefully. <whistles> Gentlemen, thank you for the game. Yeah, why don't you fellas divvy these up between you? How do, Mr. Conrad? Howdy, Mr. Parker. How are you, sir? Pretty, uh, pretty fancy shooting there. Huh? Oh, well, uh, with the... I see you hung out your shingle already. Yes, yes, I thought I'd stay around for a while. Oh, by the way, that offer of mine still holds good. I think I can always manage to squeeze in another client. Oh, yeah, well, good. I, uh, I'm in need of a little advice, as a matter of fact. I've I just been called as a witness on a lawsuit. That's so. Come on in. Tell me about it. No, oh, since I last saw you, I've been pretty busy handing out free legal advice in between shooting some pocket billiards and uh, playing marbles with some future clients. You don't even keep the marbles. I ain't no way to get rich. Oh, no, no, no. Hold on. All my advice isn't free. Besides, I got a big case coming up. To Whit Parker, the companion of the Illinois Eighth Circuit from his friend, A. Lincoln. Yes, I was proud to be his partner. 
Another lawyer, huh? Not just another lawyer. That's Abe Lincoln. The Abraham Lincoln, leader of the Illinois Bar. <laughs> oh, not the kind of bar that I've been frequenting lately. You know, back east, there's some talk of him running for president. Oh, he's a great man. First-rate marble player, too. <laughs> I ain't never heard of a president of the United States being a marble player. <laughs> well, he may be the first if he's nominated. Yeah, he just loves to play marbles with those two boys of his, Willie and Tad, you know, and their friends. Bowls a good game of ten pins, too, with those long arms of his, you know? Well, uh, what else are you good at besides uh, marbles and ten pins? <laughs> Well, one thing, he'd tell you a joke, make you split your slides laughing. Well, take it from me. A man like that ain't gonna never be president of the United States. He ain't serious-minded enough. The president's gotta be serious and smart. Oh, he's smart, all right. He's smart, it's just that, uh... Oh, he uses a joke maybe to illustrate a point, you know, like, uh, like when he and Mr. Stephen Douglas having those debates back in Quincy, you know, when they're both running for the United States Senator. I remember one time he said, Mr. Douglas, he says, that argument of yours is about as measly soup you'd get from boiling the shadow of a pigeon that's been starved to death. <laughs> that is a good one. Oh, sir. Brought you in here to talk about your case. And here instead, I'm talking about Mr. Lincoln. I'm afraid that's an old habit of mine. Sort of nasty business. It involves the Durfee brothers. The Durfees? Yeah. Remember that fellow that tried to Welsh on that bet with me in the saloon that day when me and you first met? Yeah, yeah, I know the Durfees. What about him? Well, that one's Ev. Now, he ain't nothing but a bully. But his brother, his brother Flint, he's a smart one. Sometimes a little bit too smart. For years, he's been trying to wrangle the water rights off of old Nat Sheldon. And those water rights are about the only thing that was worth leaving that Nat left his family. And now, Flint Durfee's trying to steal him from him. Steal him? Hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty strong statement, Hoss. Well, not in this case, it ain't. See, I know Flint Durfee. Flint Durfee's hired me to be his lawyer. You got yourself a pretty rotten case then, Mr. Parker. I'm not the kind of lawyer who's going to get mixed up in anything shady. You have now. Well, now, you, uh, you seem to know more about this case than I do. Yeah, I probably do. Look, Mr. Parker, about three weeks ago, I rode out to Nat Sheldon's place. Nat's been sick for several days. I found him laying there on the sofa in his parlor with a pen still in his hand. And Flint Durfee pocketing a piece of paper while his brother Ev looked on. That piece of paper signed over the water rights to the Sheldon place to Flint Durfee for nearly nothing. He'd been sick. He's clear out of his head. Now old Nat's dead. And Flint Durfee's watering his herd on the Sheldon place. Tomorrow, I'm going to be in court backing up young Nat Sheldon's case against that fraud. I've never asked you to use what little brains you've got, only your muscles. You can't even use those. But, Flint... All you had to do was throw those squatters off our land. That's all. Just throw them off. But, Flint, they had guns. You want me to get shot or something? Come in. Have a drink? No. Well, thank you. I'd uh, just like to have a little talk with you. Well, talk away. I had a visit from Hoss Cartwright a while back. He tells me that old Nat Sheldon was out of his head when he signed that agreement. You're not going to believe Hoss Cartwright over me, are you? Was he out of his head when he signed it? Well, what's the difference? I got the paper with his name on it, see? And my brother Ev here and me were witnesses. You haven't got a thing to worry about. Now, would you like to have that little drink? I'm not the kind of lawyer you evidently think I am. You'll be well paid, like I promised. That's all that matters. You go buy yourself another lawyer. You walk out on me, I'll see you never get another case in this here town! You want me to stop and flinch? Shut up, you fool! I'll tell everybody I threw you off the case because you were too drunk to handle it. Do you hear me? Drunk! 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 Oh, 
Hush. No. No, thank you. I've temporarily lost my taste for whiskey and beer, if you please. Unfortunately, Hoss, you were right about Mr. Durfee. Pity. Would have been a nice fat fee, too. Yeah, here. I got this. Thanks, Hoss. Flint, hmm? Hard name, hard man. Reminds me of a fellow in one of Mr. Lincoln's stories. A rattlesnake bit him on the chin. Well, the fellow recovered. But the snake died. Whip. What's wrong with a with a fellow like Flint anyhow? I remember Mr. Lincoln walking down a street in Springfield one time. He had his two boys, Tad and Willie, you know, one tucked under each arm, crying fit to bust. So I asked Mr. Lincoln what the matter was. Whip, he says to me. The same thing that's wrong with the world. Says I got three walnuts in my pocket. Each of them wants two of them. She agreed. That's what's wrong with Mr. Durfee. And that brother is. He's sheer honorary. Be mighty careful with him. His bite's worse than a rattlesnake's. Now, cause, come on, you're making me nervous. <laughs> Take it, he lost the case. Look, Whip, why'd you let them two buffalo you like that just now? Buffalo me? <laughs> My friend, it is better to yield your path to a mad dog than to be bitten by him and contesting the right of way. Besides, killing the dog wouldn't cure the bite, now would it? That sounds like some more of that talk from your friend, Mr. Lincoln. Well, the fact of the matter, it is. Well, you don't back down from a man. Hoss, you don't think I took that childish performance of Durfee seriously now, do you? Look, Whip, Flint Durfee ain't no child. You can't be afraid or weak. Not in Survive, not out here. I'll see you, I gotta be running. Oh, well, how about you and me playing a little pocket buddies? Huh? Come on, I'll teach you the game. I got a bunch of business I gotta take care of, Whip. Tonight? Well, I'm gonna be busy tonight, too. I'm leaving town in the morning. I'll see you. All right. Hiya, Benji. Hi, Mr. Cartwright. Mind if I walk with you? No. Enjoy the company. You don't want to stay up too late, though. It might stunt you, girl. Well, I just had to stay up late fixing up these packages for Mrs. Gentry. Usually I get to bed pretty early, though. last week, don't you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think you grew some right then. <laughs> mm -hmm. I gotta deliver these packages now, Mr. Cartwright. Well, I'll see you in the morning, Benjamin. Uh, can I just cut right?
Let me buy it, Irvy. The streets plenty wide. Get out of my way. I'll take care of him, Flint. <laughs> Shot my brother. Horse Kyrie killed him. He killed him in cold blood. There you are, Ben. Thank you, Roy. How's the head? Well, it's feeling a whole lot bigger, but not a whole lot better, I'm afraid. Boss, I, uh, I'm not going to be able to get you out on bail. Ev Durfee made it hard all around. Even got him to get a, an outside prosecuting attorney. Who? Byron Evans of Carson. Oh, boy. A real hanging prosecutor. He's never failed to convict. Well, let's hope that this time we can spoil his record. Yeah, I sure hope so. And that's why I think we need the best man we can possibly get, no matter who, Hoss. Paul already got a lawyer, Whit Parker. Well, that's what I'm trying to get at, Hoss. Nobody knows him. You hardly know him. He's a stranger whose best friend is a bottle. Well, that's one that Elf Durfee started. Look, Hoss, now you know very well that it's hard enough for a lawyer to try a case when he's sober. And Mr. Parker is a hard drinker. Isn't he? Paul, all I know is that Whit Parker ain't gonna let drinking get in the way of doing the best job he can for me. Paul, he's smart. He's real smart. If I'd have listened to his advice, I wouldn't be here now. Hoss, I'm talking about your life. We can't risk this man. That's right, Paul. It is my life. And that's why I need to have the choice in deciding who's going to defend it. Look, Paul, he's heard my side of it, and he says we got an easy case. Easy case? No murder case is easy. It needs intelligent handling. It needs Paul, a Paul, man... Whit Parker ain't a nobody like you think. Back in Illinois, he was, a, he was a very important lawyer. One of his best friends is Abraham Lincoln. You've heard of him, ain't you? Yes. Yes, I've heard of him. And if Mr. Parker was such a big and important man back in Illinois, why did he leave there to come out here? Why? Yeah, would you send that off, please? Mr. Abraham Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois. Do you know lawyer Whitney Parker? If so, please telegraph this city, collect your judgment of Parker as defense attorney in murder trial. He is defending my son. Signed, Ben Cartwright. Meanwhile, let's make sure this Mr. Parker doesn't get drunk and lose the case. Not this case. the special prosecutor. I'd, uh, you know, like to get to meet him over a game of pocket billiards. Never does any harm to get to know your enemy. Your enemy's inside, all right, but it's in a bottle. Madam, I don't need a nursemaid. Let's just keep walking, huh? Okay. 
Your Honor. Gentlemen of the jury. This is a crime so heinous, so dastardly, as to freeze the very marrow of your bones. The prosecution will prove that the defendant, Horse Cartwright, did without provocation, with malice aforethought, and with premeditation, shoot and murder an unarmed victim. The unfortunate Flint Durfee, a person so, so ill-treated by faith that, that he had to use a cane to support his, his poor, crippled body. We will show that when Flint Durfee's heroic efforts to fend off his brutal assailant with his staff, his cane, his crutch, as it were, failed, the end was merciless, cold-blooded, black-hearted murder by the miserable assassin sitting there I ask, I demand that Horse Cartwright pay the penalty for that murder, that he be hung by the neck until he is dead, dead, dead. He sure paints a pretty picture, don't he? Any word from Mr. Lincoln? No, not a word. He just came back from the telegraph office. Nothing. He probably thinks the whole thing's a hoax. He's never heard of Parker. Just try to convince Hoss of that. Look at this. If we don't hear pretty soon, I'm going to get another lawyer, whether Hoss likes it or not. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, I should like to compliment the prosecuting attorney on his fine display of eloquence. Indeed, one might say of Mr. Evans, as has been said of the great Daniel Webster, that when he speaks, he just shines his eyes, throws out his arms, and twirls his tongue around a couple of times, opens his mouth, and leaves the consequences to heaven. <laughs> If you'd be gracious enough to overlook my, my lack of eloquence, we shall prove that since my client, Horse Cartwright, is innocent, the only other person at the scene of the crime other than the deceased is guilty. Ev Durfee. <laughs> Mr. Durfee. Will you please tell us, in your own words, what happened the tragic night your brother was shot down? Well, sir, as Flint and I turned the corner and we were walking along, we met Horse Cartwright. Let me by, Cartwright. The street's plenty wide, Derby. Out of my way, Cartwright! What are you going to do? You're gonna hit me with that cane, Flint? It's about time somebody's teaching you a lesson. I'll take care of him, Flint. No! Oh. He shot my brother. Hoss Kyright killed him. And that's the living truth. He's a living liar. Your witness, Mr. Parker. Uh, Mr. Durfee, is it not true that for years your brother used you as a sort of protector? Well, if you mean protecting him from a murderer such as Horse Cartwright, yes. 
except that uh, you didn't finally protect him from murder, did you? You loved your brother. Yeah, sure. Why did you love him? Huh? What was there about him that made you love him? Well, I can't answer such a dumb question as that. Very well, then. Tell me, why did you hate him? What? What did you hate more? That he was rich and paid you off in a cowhand's measly salary? Or that he was smart and he was contemptuous of your ignorance? That he commanded and you groveled? What did you hate most? Tell me! I see here! Your honor! That is an unfair question, Mr. Parker. The witness need not answer. No more questions. What? Call horse card right to the same. And then? Well, then I did sure enough meet up with Flint Durfee, just like his brother said. But I wasn't going to let Flint Durfee buffalo me like he did Mr. Parker. Let me buy Durfee. The streets plenty wide. Get out of my way. I'll take care of him, Flint. No! When Flint hit me with his cane, my gun went off in the air and I almost blacked out. My head cleared and I saw that Ev had shot his brother. That's the way it really happened. Thank you, Hoss. Your witness? No questions. Very well, Hoss. You may step down. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, we, we now have one man's word against another. But there was a third witness to the murder. And that is Benji Lane. It's just like Mr. Cartwright said. Well, I saw Skin Flint Durfee hit him with his big old cane, and Mr. Hoss was hurt something awful. And his gun went up in the air. Thank you, Benji. <coughs> uh, just a moment, Benji. Yes, sir? You and the horse cart ride are great friends, aren't you, Benji? We sure are. Horse cart ride's a hero to you. Someone you want to grow up to be like. Now, isn't that so, Benji? Yes, sir. Just how much do you really like him? Well, like I told you, a whole lot. Enough to lie for him? If, if it would save his life. <laughs> I object, Your Honor. Objections overruled. Answer the question, Benji. Mm, sure, I'd lie. To save his life. But, Benji, when you told your story on the stand here just now, you didn't lie then, did you? No, sir. I told exactly what I saw. Good boy. Good boy. Dr. Kleiser, you performed the autopsy on the deceased, Mr. Flint Durfee. I did, sir. Using yourself as a model doctor, would you show the course taken by the fatal bullet? Yes, sir. The bullet entered an inch above the navel, here. And it lodged an inch to the right of the fifth lumbar vertebra, here. About five inches lower. Note that, gentlemen. Then what direction did the bullet take, Doctor? Why, downward, of course. Cartwright and his victim were both in an upright position. The gun was slanting down when fired. I object, Your Honor. That is an opinion of the witness. On the contrary, it is incontrovertible evidence. If, as counselor contends, Mr. F. Durfee shot his brother, the course of the bullet would have had to have been upwards. But it didn't go up. It went down. Down, gentlemen, down. Proving that Horse Cartwright is not only a liar, but guilty of unprovoked attack and cold-blooded murder! Order! Order in the court! Order!
Hoss, your father wants me to withdraw from the case. Now look, Paul, Don't I... you realize the dangerous situation you're in? Do you realize that if something doesn't happen before that court reopens this afternoon, that jury will go out with a foregone verdict? Paul, I'm sure that will. Mr. Parker doesn't seem to have one notion of an idea. That's right, Hoss. Right now, I don't have one idea. Mr. Parker, I seem to recall that you told my son this would be an easy case. Well, what happened? How come you're having the same information Evans had? Because I believed what your son told me, Mr. Cartwright. Whit, don't you still believe me? Yes, Hoss, but... Well, maybe when Flint struck you, you fired at him without really knowing. No. No, I, I was dizzy, but I wasn't that dizzy. My gun went off in the air. Ah, well, maybe a new lawyer will be able to come up with something. I don't want a new lawyer. Hoss. Stick with me. I think maybe it's time I told you what happened with Mr. Lincoln and me. He, uh, he was traveling the 8th Judicial District, you know. He shares his cases in different towns with different lawyers. I was his associate in Clinton, Illinois. We were trying an important case. Mr. Lincoln had to leave town before we finished, so I took over on my own. And then some uh, trouble come up at home. I went out and got roaring drunk. First time ever, you know, but while I was working. That is, I made a spectacle of myself. Lost the case. I was afraid to face my client and Mr. Lincoln, mostly. Mr. Lincoln, so I just decided to run off, heading for California. Wound up this far. And... Look, Whit, do me a favor. Don't run away this time. Hoss, believe me, you'd be much better off with some other lawyer. So, son, yes. Well, gee, I don't know why they don't believe Mr. Haas and me. We wouldn't lie about a thing like that. I know that. I know that, Benji, but you see, they're the medical testimony. But it was as plain as day, Mr. Parker. Yeah, I know. I know that's what you testified in court, Benji, and we appreciate it. Well, you tell Mr. Haas I'll do that testifying again, anytime he wants me. I'll tell him so. Thanks, Benji. What is it, Mr. Cartwright? I'd, I'd like to request a little time to hire a new attorney. Mr. Cartwright! Mr. Cartwright, sir, will you please, would you postpone that request? Well, Mr. Parker, you voluntarily withdrew from... I know. 
I know, sir, but I have an idea. I realize your son's life is at stake, but do you think you, you could give me one more chance? Your Honor, I, I withdraw the request. Very well. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, I have a request that I believe essential to, to the defense. What is it, Mr. Parker? I request that the billiard table in the Silverado Saloon be brought into this courtroom. I object, Your Honor, at this indignity. But this is a trial, not a circus. Your Honor, Horse Cartwright has more than mere dignity to lose. I beg that you grant my request. I now call Mr. Byron Evans to the stand. Your Honor! Mr. Evans, I don't think it necessary that you be sworn in. But as a fellow enthusiast of the ancient and honorable game of pocket billiards, may I ask you please to demonstrate your expert technique for the gentlemen of the jury. Mr. Parker, is this uh, relevant to your defense? I assure you, Your Honor, it is most relevant. Seven, if you please. By all means. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, would you uh, straighten up, please, Mr. Evans? Uh, please observe very carefully, gentlemen, that the point here in the front where the cue touches Mr. Evans' chest, now that he has straightened up, is higher than the back portion of the cue where it would touch him here. However, before, when he was bent over, the point here in front, which is higher now, was lower than the point in back. Now, just for the moment, now let us imagine that the billiard cue held in this position represents the line of fire of the bullet. Now, is this the way you saw them, Benji? Yes, sir. Old Skinflint was bent over his brother, just like you are. Can't you do anything right, you bumbling fool? Now, the bullet hit Flint Durfee in the stomach, ranged upward and lodged in the lower back. Now observe. This represents the line of fire of the bullet. It looks as though it was fired downward. But, as you've just seen, it wasn't. No. It was fired upward. By F. Durfee. That's a lie! Lying on your back as the brother you hated bent over you. Trying to strike you with this cane, just as he had struck Horse Cartwright, knocking him temporarily senseless so that he didn't see how you shot your brother. A lie! I think the jury will decide who is lying, Mr. Durfee. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Paul? Paul, what I tell you? Did I tell you I had a good lawyer? Yeah, you sure did. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Ah. Parker, again, I... I just don't know how we can thank you, all of us. You'll get your chance, Mr. Cartwright, when I send you my bill. Yes, Benji. This telegram just came for you. Oh. Mr. Bartlett asked if I'd give it to you. Thank you, Benji. Parker? I think maybe you better read this. 
Just returned from out of town, replying to your inquiry, my friend Whitney Parker is a first-rate attorney. I would still trust him to defend my life. Tell him I have some cases needing his rare talents. Hey, Lincoln. Yeah, Mr. Parker. You probably have more cases in this town than you can shake a shingle at. We should be happy to have you around. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Thank you very much, sir. But I'm kind of curious about some of these cases that Mr. Lincoln may have tucked up that long sleeve of his, you know. Besides, I've, I've never been able to trim him at anything. Now, he can beat me bowling. Marble shooting? Marble shooting, yes. I'd like to get him into one game where I know I could beat him. Like, uh... Like, uh, pocket billions. Mm -hmm. Well, it did save an innocent man's life, didn't it, Hoss? Seems to me that would be one argument he couldn't resist. <laughs> Benji? Is that Mr. Bartlett friend of yours, huh? I'm gonna send me a telegram. Yeah. 